Hey everybody. So today we are going to work on Peaks 8.11b. And Peaks 8.11b has to deal with how environments change over time and the effect that has on uh, organisms changing over time. I'm going to share over PowerPoint that will also be provided to you. And we are going to do our notes today from the video. I'm not going to waste any of your time, uh, but I do hope you'll actually listen to the video and not just slam down the notes so that we can get both the ideas and the context, uh, the context that connects up the ideas. So to start off your notes, what are we learning today? The state of Texas wants you to explore how short and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations. So, what is your learning objective or your learning target? Students will be able to explore, or students will explore, how short and long-term environmental changes affect organisms and traits in subsequent populations. Subsequent means the ones that come after. Uh, this you don't need on your notes. Our essential question, what factors affect changes in organisms and populations? It's going to be environmental factors. That's what we're learning about today. And our vocabulary for today, natural selection, survival of the fittest, mutation, and adaptation. So, you see the seal hiding up on the ice, thinking it's safe. But who comes sneaking up with that nice white fur? There's a polar bear back there looking for dinner. So, we start today with a question, why are polar bears white? Imagine for yourself, why do you think polar bears are white? If you answered to help them hunt for food, you're right. It's camouflage, right? In an icy environment, a bear that matches its environment will be able to sneak up on its prey better. Right? That's why crocodiles are the color they are. That's why tigers have stripes. Uh, and lions are grass covered uh, in order to help them sneak up. That's why cheetahs and leopards have spots so that way they can sneak up as close as possible. Um, all those things help break up the um, silhouette of the animal. Uh, the, the, the leopard has spots for the same reason that uh, the military wears camo with all those blotchy different colors is because it breaks up our outline. If you've got a nice square shape, that doesn't fit in, the, in nature. But if you've got something that sort of blends in with the leaves and the trees, um, and you don't know where it starts and where it stops, uh, you're in bad shape. Okay. But what happens when the environment changes? And so what happens when there's not as much snow on the ground, not as much ice. Where those polar bears live? Well, if you're a white polar bear, you're not sneaking up on anybody. So, when the environment changes, animals must adapt or go extinct. And a lot of times they can't choose to adapt. In fact, most cases they can't choose to be a different color. Right? I can put on a green jacket if I want to go here. Polar bear doesn't have that option, right? So if he's a white polar bear born into a green world, he's likely going to starve. When he starves, he's not going to leave behind any children. And if his children were uh, white fur in a green world, they're not going to survive long enough to make children of their own, right? And so that species dies out. But if there's a polar bear that had a little bit darker color, it might suddenly be at an advantage. So one of the things we see as there's less ice at the very northern tip of the world, as the climate's warming up a little bit, um, some polar bears are interbreeding with grizzly bears to produce roller bears, which are better adapted to a changing climate in the Arctic. Right? This guy over here on the right is a lot more camouflaged in that green and brown environment. 
right? He's going to blend in a lot better. He's going to speak up on things a lot better. So if you've got a white polar bear and a tan grower bear in a landscape that's more tan than white, the growler bear is going to survive. The polar bear is going to die out. We have an extinction. Right? And that is something that polar bears are facing. It's possibly extinction. These processes can happen on small or large scales. So how do adaptations happen? Adaptations happen by useful mutations being passed down from parent offspring. If you need to pause to get these things down, pause, get them down. Let's go on and I'll explain what you're seeing here. So uh, maybe let's let's take a look at what it says first. And, and yours might be just barely blocked by the, the bar up there. What it says is over the course of twelve days, over the course of twelve days, hundreds of generations of bacteria mutated from being killed by a certain antibiotic to not being able to live without it. So what we've got here, each little area, there's um, some bacteria that are growing here, like bacteria in a petri dish. So this is sort of layered here. So what they did is they put just a small concentration of antibiotics, and a bunch of the bacteria were killed. You see these dark areas? Those are places where the antibiotics are like, no, it's poison to me. I'm not going to go there. Right? Uh, but those that weren't killed, they produced babies who were more resistant. Baby bacteria has more resistance to the antibiotic. And those produced babies that were more resistant to the antibiotic. And those ones thrived. Now, it was just chance that some of them had some resistance to the antibiotic. But that chance could then be worked on in this different environment. Right? Uh, it's like how if you use, like, um, uh, hand sanitizer, right? And it says, like, kills 99.99% of germs. What you're looking at right here is the 0.01% of germs. Right? Those ones now, they don't have to compete with everybody else around them, like we were talking about in 8.11a, right? On competition for biotic and abiotic resources. So they thrive. And then what they do, so we've now got a whole generation of bacteria that can stand a little bit of antibiotics. So then in the next area, let's put 10 times as much. Now, most of the bacteria that can survive in a little bit of antibiotic, they die out. They can't make it in this extra, uh, this extra strong antibiotic. But some of them can. So that 0 0.01 of the 0.01%, they start reproducing because they can handle it when no one else can. They fill it in all the way up to 100 times and 1,000 times. Now, these bacteria over here, what will sometimes happen is in these really crazy extreme environments, they will um, be so resistant to the antibiotic that they might actually need it to live. They can't live without it, right? Because they're used to living in an environment that's just flooded with antibiotics. And so if they try to live back over here, man, the other, the other bacteria, they would survive. But up here in the middle, they are the only ones that can live. Something really, really completely fascinating happened with this um, early in the history of life on this planet. So when the first uh, plants were photosynthesizing and making oxygen, they were just pumping oxygen and pumping oxygen and pumping oxygen into the environment. And for most living things, oxygen was poison. It killed them. Right? Because the plants were taking in the carbon dioxide, pumping out oxygen. So the plants were filling up early planet Earth, like, you know, two or three billion years ago. Uh, early planet Earth with poison, oxygen. Then some animals, kind of like these bacteria here in the middle, they started to be able to live in the oxygen and live in more oxygen until animals today can't live without Oxygen. We have this completely symbiotic relationship with plants, but originally plants poisoned everything else around them, like the walnut tree we talked about last time. So what you're seeing is something's called descent with modification. 
that the descendants that are left behind, when they have random mutations, when there are different stresses in the environment, that can make it possible for those mutations to be useful adaptations, useful traits, something that helps the animal rather than not affecting it or being harmful. This is actually what happens in hospitals. And I know a lot of my students want to become things like doctors or nurses. Right? Or you might be in a hospital one day or your family members might be in a hospital. So in hospitals, this is how we get dangerous bacterial strains called MRSA, M-R-S-A, which is methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus. Uh, staphylococcus aureus is staph infection. If you get a cut on your finger and you get a staph infection, usually you can treat it with antibiotics and it goes right away. A staph is a little, like, um, they're little spherical bacteria. They can hurt you, especially if there's too much. Um, but in hospitals, people would get staph infections after surgery and stuff, and so we'd get them antibiotics. People get more staph, uh, different people get staph infections, we get them antibiotics. Well, we ended up putting so much antibiotics on that staph infection that, like the bacteria here in the slide, it started thriving to where we were trying to poison it, and it was doing nothing. So what we accidentally did in hospitals is breed a superbug, breed a super powerful bacteria that we have to invent new ways to try and kill before it kills the patients. Okay? So in the hospitals, they try to be really careful these days about when they give antibiotics. Because if they give too many antibiotics too often, you'll end up with strains or, or um, like families of bacteria that it doesn't work on. Right? Some similar things can happen with hand sanitizer too. Okay? So this MRSA evolved, that's what we're talking about, it evolved, and it's extreme, extremely difficult to treat with medicine because they evolved resistance to it. Right? And it's not that one did, it's that one had a baby that was naturally resistant. And that baby was able to thrive where the other one passed out, or, or uh, uh, passed away. It had more babies that were able to survive in it, and then you have you know, new species. The same thing can happen in nature that we see happen in hospitals. This is the current scientific understanding, or scientific explanation, I should say, for how the first land organisms evolved. When we look back through the fossil record, we see animals like Tiktoek, uh, and that's indigenous language for missing link. And uh, much like whales, much like frogs and squirrels, and like a lot of fish, this ancient organism, it's an ancient um, amphibian, um, it has bones in its arms and legs incredibly similar to bones that dinosaurs make. Dinosaurs that walked on land like crocodiles and stuff. But for this amphibian, it was more of a flipper than um, a leg. But it had the, 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 the pieces there that then could be useful in a new way. Instead of just being a flipper for swimming, it could now be used to pull itself from pond to pond. So if this amphibian, it looks something like a giant river salamander. This is a real animal. This is in Chinese rivers. It's a Chinese giant salamander, the largest amphibian on Earth. It's like three or four feet long, big and slimy. So these things still live today. Tiktaalik would have been very similar to it, uh, but honestly much more primitive. Um, what Tiktaalik was able to do is when its environment went from one that was all swamps all the time to some swamps with more dry areas in between, Tiktaalik now had something useful, kind of like that bacteria that was resistant to the um, antibiotic. Tiktaalik had, in early forms of arms and legs, it could go from
from small to small. Right? This is something that the other fish, if they just have little things like this, they can't do. Right? So this was something that was just random, but it turned out to be useful as the environment changed. And that's what we're talking about, how changing environments can end up with changed organisms. So, a lot of people like to know about questions like this. Okay, amphibians and reptiles have all come Why are there still fish? So, there's some reasons for this. And what we're talking about here is called speciation. How one species becomes two species. So, species which diverge from each other may use different environments or food sources. Right? So, that might be what Tiktaalik is doing. Others of these amphibians find all that food in the water. Tiktaalik finding some bugs on the land. Maybe. Uh, sometimes an evolved species will drive another one into a station. So, if one drives out another one, um, then that other one's gone and you're left with just what was there originally. This happened between humans and Neanderthals. So we have evidence that 200,000 years ago, there were not only Homo sapiens, you and me, uh, with our thin bones and our high foreheads, but Neanderthals with their big eyebrow ridges and their beefier bones. Right? Um, and we were separate species, but Homo sapiens appears to have been more advanced. We may have had more advanced language, more advanced culture, more advanced technology perhaps more advanced teeth, um, and we were able to either outbreed or outcompete the Neanderthals, so that now there's just one species of, of homo, human, whereas there used to be two or three or four or five. It's not just homo neanderthalensis, but homo erectus, homo habilis, homo rudolphensis, right, going on back. Okay. Now, some evolutionary changes can be driven by human activities. What you're looking at up over here, unfortunately, is um, a bunch of dead elephants. Go ahead and pause and think for yourself, why might those elephants all be dead? They look nice and healthy. I can read them then. Well, one of the fascinating things we're seeing in Africa is, uh, oh, in other parts of the world, because there are Asian elephants too. But African elephants have very good tusks. But elephants are evolving to not have tusks. Why would they do that? Why would elephants not have tusks? Well, if an ivory poacher comes along and kills all the animals with big tusks, and the only ones who make babies and have the next generation be born are the ones with small tusks or no tusks, that means that everybody who's, every elephant who's making baby elephants has small tusks or no tusks, because they're the only ones that are left alive. We've got an artificial pressure, right? And so, a changing environment, this desire to have elephant tusks for things like um, traditional medicines or for trophies, um, this has created um, a different environment with different biotic competition. Right? So now the elephants are trying to stay alive. Well, people are trying to shoot them right? to take their trust tusks as trophies in for medicine. Right? So that competition then makes it possible for certain just random mutations, right? Because if you're an elephant and I'm an elephant and I've got big tusks and you've got small tusks, who cares? Unless people keep killing me for my big tusks and leaving you alone because you don't have big tusks. Right? then you're the one who has babies, and your babies have small tusks. So we can see these processes going on. That's what you're looking at here. These are adult male elephants. No tusks. Okay. Why? Because their dads and moms um, weren't shot by the poachers. Right? These guys over here, little tiny baby tusks. Why? It's because they're the ones who were left. Okay. Now, a favorite example um, at every level is the peppered moth. You'll see this on STAR. You'll see this on your sample practice test. So get this one in your head, right, because these are the kind of things that the state wants you to know. Other examples of evolutionary changes driven by human beings. So 
During the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s in Europe, some moth species evolved to be darker in color to better camouflage themselves from predators in areas where heavy pollution covered the land. Okay. So, uh, prior to the 1800s, most moths in Europe were light and black, um, peppered, salt and pepper colored, some white, some black. Um, but what happened was when the Industrial Revolution came along, everyone was burning coal all the time for heat and fuel. And coal puts out a lot of soot. And so a lot of soot was going in and landing on the trees. Now, if the tree becomes completely blackened by soot, if you're a white moth, a lot like that solar bear in the green landscape, you are sticking out like a sore thumb. And when these bats came to eat these moths, they ate up all the light colored ones. Now, some moths were born just randomly with mutation, jet black. Right? And normally, no big difference. They can still hide pretty well. But suddenly, when the environment's jet black, these guys are superstars. It's not that they're superstars, it's just that the, the other animals don't see them as well to eat them. So they are more likely to survive and make little baby moths that are also jet black and tough. Right? And then, there were environmental protections that were put into place. And these environmental protections limited pollution. So suddenly, all the soot's not going out and covering the trees. And suddenly, these dark colored moths were sticking out like sore thumbs, and the light colored moths were again camouflaged. Right? So the moths adapted by more lighter colored individuals surviving to produce offspring, offspring by escaping predation. Right? So these black ones were getting eaten up now. And the ones that were, again, just randomly born, sort of salt and pepper colored, um, they were more likely to, to survive. Now, adapted, it's not like they chose, oh, I better put on my white and black coat. It's no, it's the babies that were born with the white and black coloration survived better. The babies that were born with the dark black coloration survived worse when the environment changed. So we're back to these guys. This is what's referred to as survival of the fittest and natural selection. Now, if at any point you're thinking, whoa, 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 this sounds like the sort of thing I've been warned about, um, stick around to the end, because we'll deal with that. For, for this moment, though, these are things we observe. There's different ways we can argue about it or think about it. But these are things we have evidence for, things we observe, and so we can stick our hands in our ears and go, oh, no, no. But, I mean, honestly, the state of Texas doesn't want you to do it. It wants you to recognize that when environments change, organisms adapt. And they don't choose to adapt. It's random. But that randomness then allows for some things to be better suited, some things to be worse suited. Okay. All right, so you see this guy over here? Nearly invisible over on the left. See the dark colored one over here? Almost the same landscape. Who's the bat going to eat? The one that sticks out. So mutations which allow organisms to produce more offspring are advantageous or beneficial. Those that make it harder to survive lead to natural selection. They're getting removed from the gene pool. Now, if you wanted to pause here and pick back up with the rest of these notes on Friday, that would be a good time to. But I'm going to include this all on the same um, video, and you can pick right back up. Okay, so let's finish it up. Normally, these notes would take two days to get through, especially this last discussion. Okay, so some of these environmental changes um, are sort of famous or maybe infamous in history. The extinction of the dodo bird, and the near extinction of the buffalo. So other evolutionary changes have been driven by human activities. One example is with the introduction of invasive species that can drive populations that are slow to adapt towards extinction. A new biotic factor in uh, the South Pacific, in places like New Zealand, um, was... Um, Human colonists 
on islands that humans had never been to before. Right? So with sailing technology from the 1400s forward, sailors were coming to islands where there had never been sailors before. Um, and sailors are great hunters. Right? And sailors are hungry. They've been sailing at sea for months, eating month-old rotten food. And suddenly you have a bird about the size of a chicken or a turkey. And this bird has no idea in the world that humans are dangerous. Right? Go try and pick up a squirrel with your hands. See what happens. This squirrel's gone, yeah? The squirrel, um, squirrels for generations and generations and generations have lived in areas where humans were, and the squirrel has an instinct of fear for humans. Because those squirrels that didn't are in squirrel pie. Right? And the squirrels that said, I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Those are the squirrels that made the squirrel babies. And the squirrel babies said, I know, I'm getting out of here every time they saw a human. So it becomes instinct. But the dodo is called the dodo because it kept acting what we would call stupid, right? Because it walked right up to a sailor. The sailor didn't even have to shoot his musket. And he just picked the guy up, plucked his feathers, and put him in the pot. And the sailor's got chicken dinner for the first time in two weeks. And so, uh, oh, <laughs> and donuts also have eggs that are almost the size of ostrich eggs. So you get chicken at night and omelets in the morning. This is a godsend to uh, the sailors in the South Pacific. But um, to the dodo, it meant to extinct. One of the other things that happened is that on those boats were cats and rats and pigs. And the pigs ate all the eggs, the rats ate all the eggs and the birds, so the cats, and um, the dodo was driven to extinction by a change in the environment. Same thing with um, European colonists moving across in Manifest Destiny, um, the American Midwest. The famous stories go that uh, as the trains were going by from the East Coast out to California, that hunters would just take their rifle and just shoot buffalo out the window for fun. So what you're looking at here is a mountain of buffalo skulls, right? That new biotic factor, a particular culture of humans coming across the Midwest, um, nearly drove the buffalo to extinction. But even the European colonists figured out, oh, wait, man, it might be nice to have some of these guys around. And so buffaloes were brought back from the brink of extinction, from the edge of extinction. Okay, and this happens with cats, rats, and pigs on many Pacific maps. There's lots of examples of the not just the buffalo. Uh, and it's happened with um, native peoples as well. So like woolly mammoths and mastodons, we have... Um, Archaeologists dug up bones of woolly mammoths with spear points that were either uh, chipping onto the bone or stuck in the bone. Uh, and one theory for why woolly mammoths don't exist is that early humans across the world hunted them to extinction. It would be a crazy time to be a human living 20,000 years ago. You got your spear and your fire, you're going to go kill an elephant. Those are some metal people. Okay, I'm going to stop now because it's going to stop me. Let's pick up here. We'll pick up with the notes in the next video. Oh, no, wait, I can continue. I'm going to continue. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Part of the reason why animals like the dodo bird and the buffalo faced extinction was because they were slow at reproducing. Populations that produce offspring, many offspring quickly, have a better chance to produce offspring the beneficial mutation to help them adapt to changing environmental conditions. So the dodo would be like one egg a year. That's not a lot of chance for random birds to be born that realize that humans are just naturally are fearful and right? have an instinct for fear. Right? Uh, the buffalo, similar thing. They didn't have, they, they weren't giving birth to enough buffalo babies fast enough to have some that either had thicker skin to dodge some bullets or to, to block some bullets or had the sort of idea to go hide in the forest or something. They were living on the plains. They're crazy. Right? Um, so, what's the upshot of this? What does it matter? What's the difference? 
Well, one of the things we're seeing is that some mice are evolving to be poison resistant. So a mouse pregnancy lasts three weeks, produces up to 14 days, three weeks. Humans take nine months, takes a mouse three weeks to go from no baby to baby being born. And instead of having one, two, at most three babies, they can have up to 14 babies every three weeks, right? Up to 10 times a year, right? So one mouse, 140 babies. Each one of those mice can produce 140 babies. I guess just the females, right? right? And they begin reproducing. They reach sexual maturity at the age of eight weeks. So they can start making more baby mice at age eight weeks old, right? Humans need to be into their teens, early 20s, before they can start successfully having children, right? So if I've got mice and I want to poison them, much like the bacteria, if I poison 99% of the mice, but one of them just by random chance is resistant to that poison, in a year's time, you've got a whole population of mice who you can't poison anymore because it doesn't do anything to them. Right? So these things make a difference. Right? These environmental, ecological, and biological processes, um, they have real-world effects in medicine, in pest control, in, um, in ecology, like what animals are left on the planet and stuff. So, for these sorts of reasons, it might not be hard to see why ancient mice outbred the dinosaurs, right? The dinosaurs, huge and terrifying. But it takes a long time to get to be that big, right? If you're a little mouse living 66 million years ago, right? you are going to have more babies more quickly, and a lot of them are going to be food for the dinosaurs, uh, but some of them might have some little mutations that are just random that when an asteroid comes and the environment changes wildly, you might be able to eke an existence out where the brontosaurus couldn't. Okay? So dinosaurs were generally slow breeders with adaptations to specific environments and habitats. They were uniquely suited to their um, environments. Some people, uh, some scientists have remarked that the dinosaurs were so well adapted to their specific habitat that when the asteroid came and changed everything for just like three years, that they were a victim of their own success. They were so good at living in their world that when their world shifted, even for a short time, they weren't able to adapt. They weren't adaptable. That is, except for the ones with feathers, which survived, reproduced, and became the birds we know today. That's why a chicken has a very similar foot to a Tyrannosaurus rex. That's why a, a parrot has a beak like a Triceratops did as well. They're in a similar lineage. Some things are retained. So, when a meteor strike upset stable environments, mammals and bird-like dinosaurs, bird-like dinosaurs were more adaptable. Right, so, you got this cute comic um, way back in the day, the velociraptor ch chasing the little primitive mammal. Right? Now, over time, the mammal was getting a little hardier, and a lot of the dinosaurs were getting smaller. Uh, and learning to do things, or getting the ability to do things like Clyde and fly. Uh, and getting feathers to, to help insulate and keep them warm and changing in different environments. Uh, but so they were getting to be sort of one-on-one, -on -one, and you get things that are more like weasels and saber tooths and things that are more like chickens, until now it's the fox that chases the hen instead of the other way around. So we do have evidence of some things like this. How do we even know any of this happens? Um, well, we know it from seeing it in the real world, uh, we also have fossil evidence, and a lot of these are called transitional fossils. So we have these for things like bird evolution, snake evolution, whale evolution, and horse evolution. What you're looking at right now is an animal living around 66 million years, oh no, far more than that, 150 million years ago. Right? We have its implantations of flight feathers. This animal could at the very least glide and maybe even do power to flapping flight. 
But notice that it also has claws. Right? Birds today, none of them have claws, except for one. There is one bird left with claws on its hands. It's called the hoatzin. The hoatzin is a type of uh, it's a type of fowl, similar to a chicken. But when the babies are born, they still have two claws left on their hands to help them climb bushes, which is probably what this guy would do, a lot like a gecko um, or a flying squirrel. He would have crawled up into the tree using claws and then glided from tree to tree if there was a predator. There's lots of predators. Notice also that this guy has teeth in his mouth. So this is a bird with claws and a dinosaur face, right? And the only thing that scientists can do when presented with this evidence is say, it looks like this is where we got dinosaurs from. It doesn't mean that it is. We're, I'm sorry, where we got birds from. It doesn't mean it is where we got birds from. It just means that's what it looks like. This is the claim, evidence, reasoning thing that we were talking about in our first unit of the year. Looking at a snake, right? Snake, tons of ribs, tons of vertebra, that's backbone. What do we have over here? Legs. This is a snake with legs. This lizard isn't using its legs to walk. Look how little babies they are, these little baby legs. He's not going to use those to walk. These are just sort of leftovers. If you've got an organism that its legs got smaller and smaller, and that provided some benefit to it, right? because it was able to move faster just by snaking its body over. Maybe it was able to get down holes faster to go hunt something else or to hide from predators better if he didn't have legs getting them stuck and getting them eaten. So that the guy with the legs got eaten. The guy with the tiny little baby legs snuck into the hole and was safe. These are often referred to as vestigial. It's just the vestige of a leg. It's not even useful anymore. We also have a great record of the transition from a land-dwelling, sort of like a hippo, sort of like an otter creature, to a sea-dwelling one, much more otter-like, but sort of starting to get a lot more like a dolphin, to getting far more dolphin-like with some leftover legs, tiny little leftover legs, until now. You remember that uh, sperm whale we saw last time? Um, some sperm whales, but not all, and other types of whales too, some of these whales will have a hip bone. Whales don't need hips. Whales don't have legs. No legs, no need for hips. Why do they have a hip bone? Because their parents, way back when, were on land. They were land-dwelling mammals. Right? And so some of them still have that hip bone that's so we have the intermediate fossils too. And you will see this means walking whale. We got the same thing for horses. So let's get to what people want to deal with, which is is evolution a dangerous idea? Because there's people who will tell you right, that it is. Here's what we can say. In science, we can't say that a theory is true or false, only that it has not yet been disproved. We don't know evolution is true. It's just that it hasn't been shown to be false, demonstrably, clearly, definitively, or to the um, satisfaction of the scientific community. Charles Darwin himself struggled with these things. Here's what he wrote in The Origin of Species in 1859. He wrote, There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. These were the last words of his book that revolutionized biology. The way he put it is, I don't know how this all works together. 
I don't know how these ideas interact with people's ideas about religion. But this is me trying to make sense of the evidence. Right? For him, it's something that appears to have been started by a creator. So what does science do? All science can do, all it's ever able to do is say, this is the evidence, right? So that's what you saw today. That's what you'll see on the start test is evidence of environments changing and species changing response. And all we can say is that this is the evidence and this is the explanation that appears to fit the evidence the best. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a discussion board so that you guys can discuss these things and then you'll have some questions to answer about this to see if you understand how changing environments can result in changing organisms and species. I think that's it for today. Yeah, there's some uh, sample questions. We'll go over those together as we go forward. So let me know what your questions are. Let me know what your comments are, your discussion is. We have some lively and fun discussion about it. Um, but that's what you need to know is that when environments change, species either change with them or a lot of times they'll die out. And those changes are random until something can work on that randomness. All right. That's it, guys. Um, have a good day, and I will see you in our next class. Thanks. Bye.